So the question is, there's a good book for Kashmiri Shaivism? Plenty, plenty. Um, the original texts are, oh, yes, is that uh, Ortega uh, uh, translated by? Danny Nuri, yes. So uh, there are many translations. It's become particularly popular these days. Um, the original texts have a good translation in Motilal Banarsi Das by Jaydev Singh. So there's a translation of Shiva Sutras with the commentary into English, the translation of Spandakarikas into English. That's another translation of Spandakarika there. Jaydev Singh has translated Shiva Sutras, Spandakarika, uh, Vijnana Bhairava, um, um, then a number of other texts also. Many texts are there, and almost a lot of them have been translated. It's a huge literature, actually. All right, let's start with. Um, with a um, um, chant of Om for a minute, and do it at your own pace. So I'll start with where we ended. A couple of questions were there from, uh, what's the gentleman's name? Vikas Ji, right? Vijay. Vijay Ji. So two questions. So we feel that we are pure consciousness, or whatever you're talking about, pure uh, being here. But when we go outside, we start talking, we become, our attention is divided, we become different, he said. Um, is there any solution for this, what he calls a disease? This is the disease of being sort of scattered. And we feel it in different ways. You might not phrase the question in that way, but you do phrase the question. Um, um, the answer to that is, first I'll give you the answer from the perspective of the different other yogas, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and then come to jnana yoga. The answer in jnana yoga is more is radical and very subtle. From karma yoga perspective, when we transform our philosophy from being a personal philosophy, from being selfish to selfless. Why am I here? My central purpose is, how can I be of help? Swami Ranganathanandaji, a revered memory, who is the 13th president of our order, he used to say, what is spirituality? When I close my eyes, I find peace within. When I open my eyes, my attitude is, what can I do for you? That is spirituality. And it's exactly the opposite of what we do. When I close my eyes, no peace. When I open my eyes, not what can I do for you, what can I get from you? Just the opposite of this is spirituality. So when I transform my philosophy into being selfless, my concern is not so much with myself. My concern is for what can I do for others. Then you will notice wherever you are, in whatever condition you are, you're generally a helpful person and generally constructive, um, seeing what you can contribute to it. I remember one of the most, um, kind of like a wake-up call, I saw in a classroom in a school in Jamshedpur, it's in a city in India, so one of the Ramakrishna Mission schools, in a classroom, there were these 
you know, inspiring quotes. But one of the quotes I still remember. That, uh, in every problem, ask yourself, am I part of the problem or part of the solution? And often we are ashamed to discover we are contributing to the problem in many subtle ways. We are not helping. So a karma yogi, the attitude of a karma yogi is to be of help always. Not so much concerned with one's own you know, body, mind, personal problems, even spiritual problems. And that solves your problems also. That's an interesting thing. Swami Vivekananda said, selflessness is more pain than selfishness. But it takes maturity to realize this. Our instinctive default setting is selfishness. We always try to do things for I, me, myself. Why do we do that? Because we all want to be happy. And it seems to be a no-brainer. If I concentrate all my resources, my time and energy to making this thing happy, I'll be happy. But the serious mistake there is, I have thought of myself as this thing. As, a, as Vedanta, all our efforts yesterday and today show, I am not literally this thing. I am much bigger than this thing. So karma yoga takes advantage, bases itself on that intuition and shows us that you are not this little thing. The more you find your life in the larger life of all beings, the more happy you will be. Because the Vedanta can explain that. Why? Why is selflessness, why does it make you more happy than selfishness? It's because selflessness takes you to your real self, which is in the self of all beings. You are one with the universe. That's why when our life is in a larger cause than one little body mind, we are actually happier. So, Karma Yoga solves that problem, the philosophy of Karma Yoga, that my existence is for others. Therefore, I'm not so worried if I'm sitting quietly in meditation or going out there and talking with people. I am with myself. I am serving the greater self in, in all these ways. Bhakti Yoga solves this problem. Where is my heart? Is it in a hundred different things in the world? Then I'll always be disturbed. My meditation will be disturbed. When I open my eyes, also will be disturbed. Because my mind is running after a hundred different things. When all that I want, I want, I want is taken up and concentrated into, I want only one thing and that one thing is the infinite God. I love God and God only. So Ramakrishna says in Bengali, he said, I mean, my revolchi. I am mean, telling you, I mean, in God's name, I am telling you, you said in mother's name, I am telling you the, the truth, I do not know anything except God. Now, when you have that, you will have peace automatically. Whether you are alone or you go out there and talk with a dozen people, your mind is, see, uh, our uh, uh, mind is always where our heart is. Our, if our heart is with God, that's it. Then Raja Yoga or Dhyana Yoga, meditation solves this problem by focusing the mind. Wherever we are, in whichever situation we are, the mind is on God. By careful training of the attention. Sri Ramakrishna gave the example of these village women in India. He saw that they would go to the village well to collect water uh, with pots of different, water pots of different sizes. And when they would come back home, they would go in a group and they would come back home they would keep the water pots, the big one, then the medium one, and the small one, one on top of the other. And then they would walk back. And they would gossip with each other, the, you know, the news of the day. They would talk with each other about whatever, what's happening in the village, the village gossip. Uh, I mean, like today's social media, you know. And yet, they are careful that the water pots do not fall down and break. That's the, that's the important thing. It's not one of the many things. It's the first thing. And after that, the gossip. And it's, they are so well practiced in that, they are happily talking with each other and gossiping, but the water pots are intact. They have trained themselves to do that. Similarly, meditation trains you to keep at least a part of your mind on God throughout the day. In classical Indian music, there is a background drone. The tambura drone is there. So tambura drone is there, the background drone. That background drone should always be a divine drone. It could be... Um, the mantra, it could be in, in whichever way, the heart should be on God. Uh, attention also, part of the attention should be on God. You might say there are certain things where you have to give all your attention to that work. Yes, true. But then immediately, Sri Ramakrishna has another example. He has endless examples. Suppose your mind is taken away from God. 
But then immediately when that task is ended, it should swing back to God. And he gives the example of the compass needle. The compass needle of the compass, when you spin it around, it spins around, but it again comes back to the north-south orientation. Similarly, the compass needle, needle of our, uh, our attention, even if it's swung around by the pressures of the world, job, family, whatever, the moment that pressure is taken off, it swings back to God. But that takes training. It takes a lot of years of practice. For us, what happens, it, to point it towards God itself takes a lot of effort. And it's very easy to disturb it. <laughs> and a long time it takes to come back again. But I have seen in the case of many senior monks, they're exactly like the compass needle. They swing back to God no matter what. Whatever you are talking about, whatever the t- they'll come back to the topic of God. So these are the different ways in which we can train our mind through selflessness, through bhakti, and through a cultivation of daily meditation, the daily background drone to keep it. Advaita Vedanta, however, is unique. Just contemplate what we have been doing since yesterday. That one consciousness which we are, isn't it there all the time? Then you might say, yes, it's there all the time, but we forget, Swami. We forget means the mind forgets. You are uh, Vijay. Vijay, right? So when you are here and in calm and meditation, you are Vijay. When you say you go out there and talk with different people and your mind gets scattered into many different things, are you Vijay or not? When you are thinking about being Vijay, you hardly think about it. You are effortlessly Vijay. Effortlessly. Even more, but that Vijay's name is a given name. Even more effortlessly you are consciousness. So whether you think about it or not, whether you meditate upon it or not, you are that consciousness. That understanding should be should become instilled in our intellect. Then you will be at peace. Even when you are dealing with a busy situation, where you are not even at all thinking. Just like you are not even thinking, you are Vijay. But you are Vijay anyway. And you have no trouble about it. You never worry and ask questions, how can I be Vijay all the time? You are. Similarly, you are consciousness all the time. You need not worry about it. Once that is realized. Right now what is happening is we are sort of pushing ourselves from personal identity to that impersonal consciousness. And that's why their feeling is there. I must center myself in that kind of thing. But Advaita says you are already centered there. Choicelessly. You have no choice. You are that. The second question you had was the, of the poetry. The answer is very simple. Poetry is art. And the product of art is always blissful. Even though the expression may be sad. Even that pesos is, is one of the moods, a rasa, a viraha. Uh-huh. So it's one of the different modes of artistic expression. Artistic expression is always joyful. But that, that bliss, it, there is a bliss in sorrow also. A very high artistic kind of sorrow. Yeah. So there is, there is no contradiction between the bliss, the ananda. It can be expressed as sorrowful poetry also. All right. Back to my favorite subject, the sevenfold. If you want to blame somebody, blame him. He introduced my favorite <laughs> subject. All right. Now this is, he has taken it from the Panchadashi, which is a classic text of post Shankara Advaita Vedanta. In one chapter, uh, one of those, so it's Panchadashi means 15 chapters on Vedanta. Each of them is a unique take on non-dualism. Very, uh, it's an advanced text, but very good text on Advaita Vedanta. Um, in one of those chapters, which chapter is it? Seventh or? Yeah. So it's, I think one of those chapters. One of those chapters, uh, the author, Vidyarinya Swami, he traces the spiritual journey. He classifies it or he sees it in seven stages. Spiritual journey in Advaita Vedanta. Seven stages which he has delineated. There he explains this with the help of the tenth man story. So I'll tell you the story and then we will see those seven stages and understand the seven stages in our non-dual journey. It's good that you introduced this. The story we all know, most of us know, but I'll tell you, I I never tire of telling the story. Uh, And that story itself is analyzed to bits in that chapter, every stage of it carefully. Story is very simple. Ten friends set out on a journey and they cross a river. After crossing the river, they think, um, did we all cross safely or did anybody drown? Um. Before I go ahead, 
a story within a story. I remember I studied statistics, what's nowadays called data science. I was, I said, never heard of this data science, what's it? This is what was called statistics earlier, Swami. <coughs> I studied statistics and in that, in our textbook, I remember there was a story, a funny story, and it's an old Indian story of a um, mathematician, an early Indian ma statistician, let's say, who went with his large family and crossed a river and he had children of all little, all sizes, you know. So before they crossed the river, because he is a mathematician, he said, wait, before we cross, let me use my mathematical knowledge. I'll calculate the average depth of the river. And you can already see where it, this is going. <laughs> so the average depth of the river is four and a half feet. And the average height of the family is, um, you know, five feet or something, or four, 4.75 feet. So we are safe. And he crossed. And then he fi couldn't find the two of the littlest kids. So it's a very dark story. <laughs> and then he thought, how come they drowned? I, I, my math was correct. Let me check my math again. And he found, yes, the math is completely correct. And then he lamented in a, in a, a Persian couplet, you know, uh, Urdu couplet. It's, it goes something like this. Arba jiyon ka tiyon, kunba duba kyon? Arba means the calculation, Arabic, so that was the name for the calculation because it had to come from the Hindu numerals to the Arabic numerals. So the calculations are exactly the same, Arba jiyon ka tiyon. Calculations are exactly the same. Kunba, Kunba means relatives, family. Kunba duba kyo. Why did my family drown? <laughs> Dark story. Anyway. <laughs> now the, these people, they started thinking, did, uh, did anybody drown or are we all safe? And so one of them counted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh my God, that can't be right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh God, the tenth man has drowned. And the others said, let, let me count anyway. Each of them counted and they found only nine. And they sat down and wept and cried and lamented till a passerby comes along and the passerby asks, what's wrong, my friends? Why are you crying? Oh, our friend drowned and he's dead. There were ten of us and now there are nine of us. How do you know there are nine? Because that guy must have counted and found there were ten. So we counted. There's only nine. So this passerby understood what was wrong. And he said, don't cry. There is, there are ten of you. The tenth man is safe. Where? How? Well, I'll show you. Yes, show us please, sir. Um, please count. We've counted already. No, humor me. Count again. So one of them stood up and counted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I told you, nine. And this passerby comes and takes his hand and turns it around. Ten. Thou art the tenth. Dashamastuamasi. In Sanskrit, Dashamastuamasi. You are the tenth. And this man is delighted. Oh, I see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. Oh, the tenth man has been found. And they all said, let me try, let me try. And they all found the tenth man and they were <laughs> delighted. Now, this is used by Vidyarnya Swami. It's an old story and Vedantins make good use of this. Um, this story has many sides to it. So, seven stages of the spiritual journey shown in this way. All right, tell us the seven stages. First stage, Ajnanam, it means ignorance. Stage one, ignorance. So when they um, sat there and they thought, where is the tenth person? They were already under ignorance. They didn't know that these ten people were there. They calculated one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and they didn't count themselves. And that was the ignorance about themselves that they are the tenth. I am the tenth. No. So this is ignorance, not being able to find the tenth person. How do you apply it in Advaita Vedanta? It's when we do this. Um, who am I? I'm trying to find who am I. And I find only body and breath and thoughts and intellect. And if you go beyond that, blank, that's it. So this is material existence. This is who I am. I don't find myself as pure consciousness, Atman, nothing. Because Atman, the pure consciousness is that to which all of these are appearing. That I, I don't count myself. I count whatever appears to me, I count that. This is ignorance. But what is the result of this ignorance? What's the problem? Second stage? Avarana. Avarana. My own existence is hidden. 
My own existence is hidden because of this ignorance. Avarana is veiling, hiding. Tenth man's existence is hidden. So, I can't find the tenth man. Ignorance, not knowing that I am the tenth man, then the tenth man's existence is hidden. Tenth man is not there. Result? Next? Vikshepa. Vikshepa means scatteredness, sorrow, conflict, samsara. Oh, what sorrow. What is the sorrow? My, my friend, the tenth person has died. He drowned. All of that is an inference. Why? Because I can't find him. Why can't you find him? There's an ignorance about who or where the tenth man is. Similarly, for us, because I cannot find my unlimited self as existence consciousness bliss, then what happens? The only thing that is appearing to me is this body. So I am this body. The moment I say I am this body, trapped. Birth, aging, disease, death, either fear of death comes upon me. Hunger and thirst, disease and pain and separation from everybody, a sense of competition and insecurity and this mind, this crazy mind. The, the psychiatrist R.D. Lang, British psychologist, 1950s, 60s, I think, he said that human beings are afraid of three things. One is death. We are all afraid of death. In fact, Ernst Becker wrote this book, The Denial of Death. He got a Pulitzer Prize for it. And he said, this is the greatest fear in human beings' lives and we deny death. And that's our whole project. Our, most of our activities in life come out of the denial of death. Though we don't consciously think we are denying death. We are avoiding that topic altogether. So death is one thing we are terrified of. Second, second thing we are terrified of is our own minds. What is we are going to think, do, feel? Our own minds torture us. You know, when people kill themselves, I've noticed that sometimes they, sh they shoot themselves in the head because they want this thing to stop. They're tortured by their own minds. They're scared of our own minds. What this mind will make me do next? Think next? Feel next? I feel terrible. The mind makes me feel that. Third, human beings fear, Adi Lang said, the third thing we fear is other people. We're constantly, you know, uh, attracted, repulsed, afraid, anxious, how people are going to behave with us, what they think of me, all these things. We are afraid of other people. And I was just thinking, Vedanta solves all these problems at one stroke. Death, you are the immortal consciousness. It doesn't die. You have had thousands of bodies, lives and deaths. It's nothing to you. You are well practiced in dying. <laughs> You have been doing that. You have done it a thousand times. It's nothing to you. And mind. You are not the mind. Done. You are not the mind. The mind is not yours. Don't bother about it. It's nothing to do with you. Third. Other people. There are no other people. They are all you. They are the princes of Kashi. Need not be afraid. You just feel one with everybody. Why is some person, if you're all one Brahman, this question will come, why are some people evil, why immediately someone will bring in trot in Hitler. <laughs> why is there Hitler? <laughs> all the awfulness is in the mind. The consciousness, you, the one reality gets clouded by that particular mind and then it manifests in that way. All right. Um, so, Vikshepa, this is called Vikshepa. Samsara starts because we do not know who we are and it, that is, our nature is veiled. That's why. Fourth, Paroksha Jnana, indirect knowledge. When the passerby comes and says, do not weep, uh -huh. relax, the tenth man is there, it's not dead. So they sort of calm down, they still don't know, they can't find the tenth man, they're still in ignorance. But they sort of trust this guy, the guy who comes and tells them, the tenth man is still there, he has not drowned, it's alright, calm down. Who is that? The Swami. <laughs> he comes and gives us endless lectures on YouTube and tells, <laughs> and tells us we are the Atman, we are not body, we are not mind, we are pure consciousness, you cannot die, you are one, the universe is one with you, uh, you are always at peace, you are somehow your existence, consciousness, bliss. We don't get it, we don't understand, we don't see it that way, but we sort of calm down a little bit. 
that's called indirect knowledge paroksha jnana we don't we have not solved the problem yet but it's uh, it's a kind of knowledge we have read the book heard the youtube talks attended the seminars and all okay attended the retreats that's one kind of knowledge then fifth aparoksha jnana direct knowledge realization enlightenment the eureka moment the aha moment you know where the eureka thing comes from archimedes eureka means i saw it or i found it what does it mean i found it so volume how to measure volume and then you're thinking about it but the thing you didn't know i also didn't know until recently he hated bats <laughs> archimedes yes and he had to be persuaded because he was always immersed in his physics problems so he was per- luckily he was persuaded to take a bath and then then the you know he displaced the water and he understood and he, he immediately jumped out of the bath and started running naked down the streets of athens saying eureka i found it uh, so the i found it moment the eureka moment i get it this transition from the paroksha jnana the level of uh, the youtube lectures and reading the books and listening to the swami um, and thinking about it sort of getting it and again getting confused this is indirect knowledge to so the direct knowledge i am the 10th thou art the 10th i get it i am the 10th when that person realizes i am the 10th 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 you are the 10th 10th man i am the 10th oh i am the 10th at that point let me ask you what further practices does he have to do what meditation what worship what nothing just found it it's, it's done it's just done that is called aparoksha jnana so this term paroksha paroksha i can explain just a little bit aksha means eyes literally and in a general sense sense organs ears tongue all of that so pratyaksha appearing to your eyes or appearing to your sense organs which is called perception so perceptual knowledge is called pratyaksha if you are seeing me now that's pratyaksha perceptual knowledge you are hearing me now that's pratyaksha perceptual knowledge there is something called paroksha beyond the range of your perceptual of, of your senses so there is something there are a lot of things which is beyond the range of our senses a lot of things which science talks about maybe even religion talks about So how do we know those things paroksha through study through inference through experiment or through belief in holy books they're all paroksha i don't do you see heaven right now no do you see an atom right now no you cannot but through um, our scientific instruments and through inferences based on the data i understand i know there are things like atoms i know there are things like um, say black holes or quasars or whatever which i cannot directly see right now that is called paroksha that's also knowledge most of our knowledge is paroksha we get it through inference we get it through authority we read textbooks we read uh, we listen to the news so information comes to us verbally that's paroksha pratyaksha and paroksha but enlightenment is neither through the senses because you can't see atman brahman consciousness through the senses nor is it paroksha paroksha is by reading a book listening to a lecture that's paroksha that that's what you're saying paroksha jnana that is beyond the senses i do not see it i have heard it i have understood it this is my understanding so far aparoksha is not neither pratyaksha nor paroksha it's neither persuade perceptual nor something that you get through books and lectures or through data or inference no it is direct realization that in my consciousness my consciousness let's put it this way awareness of awareness i suddenly become aware of what i am and that thing is not known through sense organs it's not known through books also books can point towards it the lecture can point towards it how is it known we did that yesterday the sense of i am two things i said one it, it is indubitable you can't doubt it second how do i know that i am this certain sense of my own existence but how is it known it is not known through knower means of knowledge and object of knowledge we did that yesterday yeah it is self shining or self revealing the self revealing nature of consciousness becomes evident to us that's the advaitic enlightenment 
or at least part of it, that you are consciousness. And this consciousness is unlimited. It's the one reality of the universe. That is the full realization. So you get this realization. Aham Brahmasmi. Like that person said, I am the tenth one. I get it. Not theoretically. He didn't say, oh, I am the tenth one. Good. That's a good bit of information. Now, how do I realize it? If the tenth guy says, I am the tenth one, you're saying that, but how do I realize it? What are you going to say to him? You look at him dumbfounded. <laughs> so that's a direct realization. Then what happens? The sixth. The sorrow goes away. The sixth stage is the sorrow goes away. Dukkha nevritti. We have found the tenth man. Immediately all the sorrow, all the crying and all of that, it goes away. Because you thought that tenth man was dead. Obviously tenth man is not dead. We have found him. Then last stage. Simultaneously, you get Paramananda, attainment of bliss. Ah, we have found our dear friend, the tenth man. We are so happy. Similarly, when you realize you are the Atman, see, this is the big thing. All sorrow goes away. And this thing, fear of death goes away. Fear of the mind goes away. Fear of other people goes away. Saat, the French existentialist, he famously said, hell is other people. <laughs> That goes away. Now other people is heaven. One thinks the yogis find joy in solitude. That's only a beginner. The enlightened one is at bliss in solitude and in the midst of a thousand people in a crowd also is in bliss. You see, um, Swami Shivananda, Sri Ramakrishna also, he'd be delighted in seeing crowds of devotees. You know, they would gather in festivals. Indian crowds, you have to be there. To those who are from India, you know. Huge crowds. And be delighted. Now why should a spiritual person, a yogi be delighted in a crowd? Sri Ramakrishna explained it beautifully. He said it's like seeing exactly that, a chandelier. You know, a mass of light. For the enlightened one, it is not people. It is consciousness blazing forth through a thousand different minds in thousand different senses. It's a mart of joy to be in the midst of this blazing display of consciousness everywhere. It's like seeing a chandelier, a mass of light. Same light reflected from thousand pieces of glass. Similarly, one consciousness. If you are alone, it's a one consciousness. But in a crowd, that one consciousness now reflected in a thousand minds. Amazing. They will dance with joy. No matter what kind of minds they are. But the consciousness is one. So that's the joy of... Uh, Realizing you go beyond all sorrow. The fear of death, the fear of the mind, the fear of other people, and the fear of hunger and thirst, the fear of failure. It is all good. Fear of disease, fear of pain. You go all beyond all of that. Even if that is there, Sri Ramakrishna at the, Mac, you know, the, at the um, terminal cancer, dying of throat cancer. A doctor told me it's one of the worst kinds of cancer there is. Dying of throat cancer. And one of his disciples says, but... How are you today, sir? And Sri Ramakrishna says, this hurts. I cannot eat. And the disciple said to him, but I see that you are in bliss. And Sri Ramakrishna laughed and he said, oh, the rascal has found me out. In Bengali, Shala Dharaniyate. See, I am suffering. It hurts. I can't eat. Any cancer patient will tell you. It's not cancer patient will tell you that. But the next part of it is amazing. How can you actually feel the pain and suffer and the weakness and the suffering, prolonged agony and the agony and yet you can see you are in bliss? How? There is a deeper level in which your bliss is unaffected. Yeah. So that is ananda prapti. Atyantika dukkha nivritti paramananda prapti. You attain bliss. Seven stages of spiritual life. What are the seven stages? Ignorance. Veiling of ignorance of your nature. Then veiling. Veiling means 10th person is dead. 10th uh, person does not exist. Sorry, 10th person does not exist. That's the veiling. I am not existence consciousness place. Then vikshepa, the third stage. The, the scattering, the sorrow, the, igno the, the mistake, the mistake which happens. What is the mistake? I am body. I am mind, 
I am this miserable guy, Sarva Priyananda, this, per this particular person, this little person with all its defects and problems and its personal history. I am this one. That is error, error. From ignorance, veiling, then error. Then what happens? Error and sorrow, consequent sorrow. Tenth person is drowned. I am this poor person and I have, um, you know, poverty and illness and failure and humiliation and, and um, you know, can't find a parking spot or something like that. <laughs> so this, all of this is sorrow. And then along comes Vedanta and tells me, uh, the YouTube talks and the books and all they tell me, tell me you are Brahman, you are Satchidananda. Hmm, okay. That's Paroksha Jnana, indirect knowledge, theoretical knowledge, intellectual knowledge, book knowledge. I get it and I like it. I hear it, I like it. But I don't understand it. The tenth person is there, but where, where is the tenth person? I believe you, the tenth person is alive. That gives me hope, but where? And then the uh, Aparoksha Jnana, the moment, the flash of realization. I am the tenth. Oh my God, I am the tenth. Then the consequence, the result of that, Dukkha Nivritti, Ananda Prapti, sixth and seventh stages. My sorrow at the death of the tenth person is gone. There is no death of the tenth person. And Ananda Prapti, the bliss, the happiness of finding our poor friend, the tenth person, is happiness is there. Similarly, I, my sorrow at being this limited little creature is gone because I am not the limited little creature. And the joy of being the limitless existence consciousness bliss, it flashes forth. Good. That's the seven stages of the spiritual journey um, in the tenth man story, using the tenth man story. Now, let me um, good. I think we can bring this back on track, time time wise. Um, let me go on to the eighth verse. Now the rest of our journey is pleasant and easy. We are on the level of enjoying bliss now. Verse number 8. Shraddha Svatata Shraddha Sva Shraddha Svatata Shraddha Sva Natra Moham Kurushva Bho Natra Moham Kurushva Bho Jnana Swarupa Bhagavan Jnana Swarupa Bhagavan Atma Tvam Prakrite Paraha Atma Tvam Prakrite Paraha have faith, my child, have faith. Never confuse yourself in this. You are consciousness itself. You are the Lord, you are the self, and you are beyond nature. All right, beautiful verse. Shraddhasvatata shraddhasva. Believe in this, my child, believe in this. Now, what Ashtavakra is telling us here is, all right, it's, I get it. It's all very subtle, very difficult. It sounds very complicated, too much philosophy. It isn't actually, but it just sounds like that because it's unfamiliar to us. He says, gives us an alternate. Forget all that. Forget everything we have done till now. You are Brahman. How? Why? Just believe it because I tell you so. Just believe in this. You believe in so many things in this world. You believe endless number, uh, number of advertisers who are selling you junk. You say, I don't believe in it. You do. You end up buying it. That shows... The advertiser doesn't want you to believe in it. He just wants you to buy the stuff. And you do buy the stuff. That's why people pour billions of dollars into advertising. It works. Even subconsciously it works. It influences your, our, our buying. Um, so you believe in all that stuff. And so much superstitious stuff in the world. Believe in all that stuff. Yeah. Fake news. Believe in all that stuff. Why not do something which will really, really help you? The best thing that could happen to you in your life. Even if you don't understand it, even if you don't get it, it's too complicated, forget it all. Just believe that you are Brahman, that you are limitless existence consciousness. Please. It says, Shraddhasvatata Shraddhasva. Have faith in this, my child. Have faith in this. 
Natra moham kurushva bho. Bho is an address. Oh, oh my child, oh disciple. Moham, delusion. Do not be deluded on this point. There's a technical meaning here. A technical meaning. Technical meaning is, there are two kinds of problems which come up after Vedantic teaching. Two kinds of problems which come up after Vedantic teaching. One is called Asambhavana. The other one is called Viparita Bhavana. Asambhavana, impossibility problem. And Viparita Bhavana, contradictory behavior problem. Okay. And you sort of see where it is going. The impossibility problem is when we are told, you are Brahman, you are infinite existence. And we say it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. How? How can I be infinite existence? For example, I exist, yes, but it's this, I exist, here, this one, this is my existence. It's not infinite. It's limited, strictly limited. It's here on this chair, this body. Not only that, it's born and it changes and it dies. So it's not unlimited in time. Unlimited in time would mean eternal. I'm always there. Um, unlimited in space would be all pervasive. I'm everywhere, but I'm not everywhere. I'm not even everywhere on this room. I'm just here. I'm not even there. I'm not, I'm not eternal. There was a time when I was not. And there will be a time when the body dies and I will not be there. So I'm strictly limited. How am I unlimited? My existence is strictly limited in space and time. Um, then you are unlimited consciousness. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm consciousness, I understand. I'm awake now. But at too much of this lecture, very soon I will become less awake. <laughs> and after a good meal, I'll go to sleep. So I'm not always awake. I'm not always conscious. How can you say I'm consciousness? And bliss, not at all. I'm only once in a while, a few times, I can count on my fingers how many times I've been in bliss in this world. Most of the time, miserable only. Or half miserable or unsatisfied. That's my state. That's my state. So this is impossibility argument. I, I don't understand how I am a limitless existence, consciousness, bliss. Then the uh, other argument is, other problem is contradictory behavior. Yeah, I've heard that I'm existence, consciousness, bliss. Now I understand. I've got it. That I am existence, consciousness, bliss. I'm beginning to understand what, what is meant. It's wonderful. However, there's a problem. The problem is, my life hasn't changed yet. You promised that you'll go beyond sorrow. I haven't gone beyond sorrow, even though I get it. You promised that I'll have endless fulfillment, but I haven't got endless fulfillment. But you promised endless fulfillment. Ananda prapti, dukkha nivritti. Going beyond sorrow, attainment of bliss. I have not got those yet. So that's called um, contradictory behavior. My, I still keep on reacting to life. I understand I'm not this body-mind, but still, I'm appearing as this body-mind. I am living through this world as this body-mind. And so my behavior has not changed. It's still what it was. I'm still acting like a limited person. So both of these have to be removed. How is the impossibility problem removed? The impossibility problem, those are all doubts. Lack of comprehension. Lack, I don't get it. How is that removed? Through manana. Through this questioning, thinking it over, until I say, I get it now. And the second one, how is this removed? This contrary tendencies, contrary behavior. It is removed through nididhyasana, through meditation. Vivekananda says, Tell yourself again and again, I am that, I am that. Until it tingles with every drop of your blood. This is assimilation of the truth. One sadhu put it in Hindi. He said, Vedanta pachta nahi hai Mahatma ji. Vedanta has not been digested. Indige indigestion. So, that has to be assimilated. So, these are the two practices for overcoming Delusion, the twofold delusion. One is, I have heard it, but I don't get it. In order to get it, you have to think it through. Question it in every possible way. Question it in every possible way until you are satisfied. At least intellectually, I have no problems. And then the second part of it, not only intellectually, I have no problems. I can live it now. I can live it in day-to-day -day life. When I'm trying to live it, I run up against a lot of resistance from the mind and body, past conditioning. That is overcome by meditation, non-dual meditation. So twofold delusion, overcome those. 
And then he makes this remarkable statement. A lot of Vedanta is packed into each verse. That's the beauty of Ashtavakra. You can teach the whole Vedanta, take up any verse anywhere and teach the whole of Vedanta there. Here is this one phrase. Jnana Swarupo Bhagavan Atma. Jnana Swarupa means pure consciousness. The nature of consciousness. Bhagavan God. The God of religion. Bhagavan. Ishwara. Bhagavan. Creator of the universe. Atma. The self. God and you the self are one and the same reality. What is that one and the same reality? What is God and what is you? Where are you one and the same reality? Where is the ocean and the wave same? Water. And remember, I must add this. Ocean and wave example, it can be misleading. So you say, yeah, wave is water and ocean is water. But ocean has much more water. Wave is only a little bit of water. That's only because the example is imperfect. <laughs> this is a part and whole relationship. Whereas in Advaita Vedanta, there is no part and whole relationship. You are not a part of pure consciousness. Pure consciousness has no parts. You are not a part of pure being. Pure being has no parts. You are, I can say the whole of it, even that would be wrong phrasing. You are it. There is only one reality. So what is that one reality? Pure consciousness. Jnana Swarupa. Let me repeat that. Jnana Swarupa Bhagavan Atma. If I were to draw it out, Bhagavan, God, Atma, Self, you, both of you are one in the sense both of you are pure consciousness. Both God and Self are pure consciousness. Let me do that TED talk thing again. In the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I'll run through um, the meaning of this. There is something in Advaita Vedanta called Mahavakya. Mahavakya. Mahavakya means great sentence. Great sentence or profound sentence. What are these Mahavakyas? They are sentences in the Upanishads which summarize the whole of Advaita Vedanta in one sentence. And what do they do? How do you define a great sentence? The definition is Akhandartha Bodhakam Vakyam or Jiva Brahma Aikya. That which gives you the identity of the sentient being and God. You and Brahman. Somebody asked about Atma Paramatma, individual self and supreme self. That which tells you of the identity of the individual self and the supreme self. That's a profound sentence. So that's a great sentence or a Mahavakya. Example, we all have heard of this. Tattvamasi. Four Mahavakyas are taken, one from each of the Vedas. But that's taken just by convention. There are many such Mahavakyas. If the definition of Mahavakya is that which gives you the identity of the Jiva and Ishwar or God, the individual soul and supreme soul, the identity is given, you are Brahman, then there are many such Mahavakyas in the Upanishads. But conventionally four are taken as representative of the four Vedas. In the Rig Veda, you find the Aitariya Upanishad. There you find the Mahavakya, Pragyanam Brahma, Pragyanam Brahma. Consciousness is Brahman, the ultimate reality. Then in the Chandogya, in Sama Veda, in the Chandogya Upanishad, you find the uh, Mahavakya. Tattvam Asi, that thou art, you are that. That's the most famous Mahavakya, Tattvam Asi. In California, uh, I heard of this gentleman whose name was Tattvam Asi. You are that. <laughs> um, so Tattvamasi, the most famous of the Mahavakya, most well known. You are that. The teacher tells you, you are that. Um, that means that what? Brahman, ultimate reality, God. Then the third one is uh, from the Yajur Veda, uh, where uh, you find in the Brihadaranya Upanishad, the Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am Brahman. Um, in different monastic orders which follow Shankaracharya, you know, the non-dual monastic orders. So there are ten of them. We belong to the Puri, for example. So, like Tota Puri, you have heard of Tota Puri? Yeah. So these are the uh, ten orders. And the orders have uh, one of the four Mahavakyas is given to the monks. So in the Puri, for example, our Mahavakya, I'm not telling you any secret. Somebody might think, oh, this is a secret, you shouldn't tell. No, this is uh, well known. Our, the Mahavakya given to us when we become monks is Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. There is a secret component. 
to becoming a monk. That is never revealed. If it is, and there are in the Himalayas, among the devout folk in the villages there, there are fears about this and superstitions also. But there, there's a secret component to becoming a monk. And if you hear that, you have to become a monk. <laughs> there's no other way. You have to leave your house and your uh, husband, wife, children, and you have to go away to the mountains and become a monk. So I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> Literally, in the, the mountains, they're very simple folk in, in the villages there. Um, so if you, if, they'll be scared. Don't, don't tell me, Swami, I won't listen. <laughs> I'm not ready yet. <laughs> But the uh, Mahavakya given to us is Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. So many of you do not know that we belong to the Puri, uh, the, the ten orders, they are called Dashnami, the ten, ten orders of monks following non dual Vedanta of Adi Shankaracharya. Um, Saraswati, Shivananda Saraswati was there recently, Dayananda Saraswati was there who passed. Um, Chinman and Rajiva Saraswati, Swami Chinman of Chinmay Mission, Saraswati. There is Giri, uh, Giri, Bharati, and then so on. Vanam, it's very rare. Tapo Vanam, it's rare. Ashram is there. Uh, then Parvata is there. Then there is uh, Sagara. Then Ocean, meaning Ocean. So like 10, ten names are there. Puri. And this funny story, let me tell you, I, I have told you earlier also, some of you know. In the mountains when I was there, so in our order, we are all Puri because we, we are disciples uh, in this particular lineage. It, we trace it back to Sri Ramakrishna who was initiated into Sannyasa by Tota Puri. So we are all Puri. So technically I should say Swami Sarvapriyananda Puri. But we just say Swami Sarvapriyananda. Vivekananda Puri and so on. Ramakrishna Puri. I was in the mountains and I, in the Gangotri, I wanted to see a genuine Naga Swami, a Naga Sannyasi. You know, they're the naked Swamis. So, um, uh, one of them said, one of the monks told me, there is one who stays there on the bridge over the Ganga. There's an old wooden bridge. On one side, there's this monk who lives there. You can go and meet him. So, I went. I saw this uh, skinny looking guy with long matted hair. He was not totally naked. He was wearing a loincloth. And he was sitting in front of a fire which he had lit. They always have a dhuni, a fire going. But it was cold. I mean, um, I was wearing a, a sweaters and shawl and everything. So I went and asked him, what's your name? And he said, Purnam Giri. He was like a fierce little bird, you know, like a shining eyes, uh, skinny. Purnam Giri. Giri. So he belongs to Giri. Tera naam kya hai? What's your name? I said, um, Swami Sarva Priyananda. Sarva Priyananda. He said, Hey, Puri kaha gaya? Sabji ke saath kaha gaya? <laughs> now, for those, for those of you, for those of you who don't, don't understand uh, Hindi, so Puri, Puri, he said, where's the Puri? You just said Sarva Pinananda, why didn't you add the Puri? The, the Puri also in Hindi means, and many Indian languages, it means a kind of bread, you know, uh, like, uh, uh, what would you call it in English? A, a, a fried bread, a kind of fried bread. It's in, inflated, luchi, yeah, it's inflated, it's puffed, up, up. yeah. So, yeah, luchi is Bengali, you, uh, it is, uh, it's not helpful, if you want to translate into English, you can't say Puri is luchi. So he was, what he was saying is, he was making a pun on that. Where is the puri? Why didn't you add it? Did you eat it with your vegetables? Did you eat the bread? It doesn't work in English. <laughs> yeah. Swami Vivekananda was very humorous about this. Um, so I, I said to that monk that, uh, um, yes, Sarva Priyanda Puri. And yes, I am Sarva Priyanda Puri. And then he was, he was quite fierce about it. He said, ah, Babu ban gaya you become a gentleman, a dandy, you know, become a dude. <laughs> you don't want to say the whole name. And then uh, Swami Vivekananda himself was a little, uh, he was quite humorous about this. Somebody asked him, Swami Vivekananda, what kind of a monk are you? Uh, are you a 
পুরি অর গিরি পুরি গিরি হোয়াট আর ইউ স্বামীজি আপনি কেমন সন্ন্যাসী পুরি না গিরি ইন বেঙ্গলি দে আসতে এন্ড সোয়ামি সেড নিদার আই এম কচোরি ইটস আ প্লে এগেন এগেন দোজ হু আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড ডোন্ট আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড বেঙ্গলি অর হিন্দি কচোরি ইজ অনাদার কাইন্ড অফ ব্রেড সো So Swami was making a play on this. So what kind of a monk are you? Are you a Puri? And he said, no, I'm a Kachori. And, and Swami, would, Swami Vivekananda, he would often do this play on words. You know, in America, he was often asked. At that time, people didn't understand the difference between a Buddhist and a Hindu in those days. Even now, some people don't. So, um, uh, so uh, they would ask him, uh, Swami, are you a Buddhist? Uh, and... the swami would reply no i am a florist <laughs> so all of that is the third mahavakya aham brahmasmi the fourth mahavakya is from the atharva veda from the mandukya upanishad ayamatma brahma this very self is brahman this individual self what you think to be individual is actually brahman the ultimate reality So the four Mahavakyas, from the four Vedas. Why am I saying all this? Because this is a Mahavakya. This one. Jnana Sarupa, Swarupa, Bhagavan, Atma. Bhagavan, God, Atma, the self, you. Pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is God and the self. Um, a quick executive summary of the Mahavakya. See, the, all of Vedanta can be understood in one sense as an analysis of the Mahavakya. This sentence, you are that. All of Vedanta can be understood, understood and taught as an analysis of you are that or I am Brahman. So the text, for example, Vedanta Sara, it could be understood as an analysis of you are Tattvamasi, you are that. And all the information that's given there, basically helps you to fit it all in and build a picture which will explain how you are that. Um, what's the problem in understanding? Because apparently it doesn't make sense. If you just say you are God, it might, you might feel cool about it. Yeah, I am God. But it doesn't make any sense. And in fact, the dualists, the um, devotees will say it's sacrilegious. The Dvaita Vedanta, they'll say Advaita, you are sacrilegious. How dare you say you are God? God? Why not? Because it's just literally not true. It's like saying the wave is the ocean. How can the wave be the ocean? The wave is tiny. The ocean is vast. The wave comes and goes. The ocean is always there. So God is, um, is Sarva Vyapi, all pervasive. You are just here. You're just a little creature. You're not all pervasive. God is eternal. You are born and you die. Maybe you're born again and you die again. But uh, as a Hindu, you would believe that. But still, you're subject to birth and death. God is not subject to birth and death. Eternal. God is all-powerful. We have tiny powers. We are weak and helpless creatures. God is all-knowing. We know so little. How can you say you're God? This is just crazy. It's completely wrong. God is all the omnis, you know. Omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. And you're none of those. So how can you say you're God? So what does Vedanta mean by that? Vedanta says that... Um, the same pure consciousness, one pure consciousness, associated with maya, gets the powers of uh, omniscience, omnipresent, omnipotent, creation of the universe, maintenance of the universe, dissolution of the universe, is what we worship as Shiva, Kali, Durga, Vishnu, and so on. All the various ways in which God is worshipped. In fact, it's worshipped in different religions, as the God of the Christians, as Allah of the Muslims, as Jehovah of the Jews. How can you say they are all the same? Because in all of them, they are all defined as the creator. Whenever there is a theistic religion, what is the common definition of God in all the theistic religions? Creator of the universe. And that is agreed by all. And all of them agree there is only one. In that case, they must be talking about it. Uh, about the same reality. If there is one and that is the creator of this universe, then we are talking about the same reality. That's why I don't understand the talk sometimes, which is difficult for a Hindu to understand. It's all the time common here. 
the Christian God, the Islamic God, the Jewish God, my God and your God, as if you're talking about multiple gods. But isn't it your religion which is supposed to be monotheistic, one God? And what is this my God and your God? Make it clear. You, you mean my conception of God, your conception of God. God as understood in my scriptures, God as understood in your scriptures. Then it's clear. But don't speak as if it, there is a Jewish God and a Christian God and an Islamic God and a Hindu God. No, 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 no. The Hindus have the widest and most diverse understanding of God. So many names and forms. Shiva, Kali, Durga, um, uh, Vishnu, Narayan. And in Shiva also in endless forms in which Shiva is worshipped. In Ganesha also endless forms in which Ganesha is worshipped. Devi also in endless forms in which the Divine Mother is worshipped. And yet there is a clear understanding. They are all that we are referring to the same reality in, in endless names and forms. So that one consciousness with the power of Maya is the creator, preserver and destroyer of the universe. Which is worshipped as God in the different theistic religions of the world. There are non-theistic religions like Buddhism, Jainism which don't talk about God at all. In the theistic religions of the world is one power which is worshipped as the creator, preserver, destroyer of the world, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. Pure consciousness gets these powers because of maya, the power of maya. And a fraction of that maya is the ignorance which veils the pure consciousness and makes it appear as individual beings like us. I'll repeat that. A fraction of that maya called ignorance, avidya, ajnana, in the language of Vedanta Sada, Vyashti Agyana and Samashti Agyana. The totality is called Maya, an individual part of it is called individual ignorance, which all of us have because of which we don't know our real nature. We don't know God, we don't know who we are. That ignorance, because of that, the same pure consciousness now appears as I, me, him, her, all of us. Living beings, individual living beings, struggling in samsara. Who is that? Pure consciousness. And this entire samsara is created, maintained and run by one power. Who is that? God, Ishwara, Bhagavan. Both are the same pure consciousness. One wearing the dress of Maya, other one wearing the dress of ignorance or avidya. And the two are not different. One is a totality, one is a tiny part. Um, Sri Ramakrishna explained it best this way. E example of the poison of the cobra. Cobra has all the poison in its mouth, in the glands, poison glands. And a little bit of that poison is enough to knock out its prey, um, you know, a frog or a rat or something. But all the poison is in the mouth of the um, cobra, it doesn't do any harm to the cobra. Not only that, it's the power of the cobra. Similarly, a little bit of maya is enough to knock us out into samsara. We don't know who we are, we don't know God, we don't know the reality, we are helpless in samsara. All of that power is with Ishwara with God. It doesn't do any harm to Ishwara. It's the power of Ishwara. Another way of putting it is Ishwara or Bhagavan is God. Maya Dhisha, the Lord of Maya. And we Jeevas, all of us, we are Maya Dhina, under the domain of Maya, under the control, the spell of Maya. Right. But we are actually the same. How are we the same? Without the dress. In itself, the reality is one pure consciousness. It's like saying, you go on a Broadway play and there's someone who's the, the emperor in the play and there's a beggar in the play. And then somebody tells you the beggar is the emperor. And that's not true. The emperor is all powerful. The beggar is just a beggar. The emperor is so rich and the beggar is just a beggar. <laughs> not rich at all. The emperor is clad in glorious clothes, uh, you know, shiny clothes. The beggar is clad in rags. How can they be the same? But you understand what is meant. It's the same actor playing both roles. The emperor is not the emperor. The beggar is not the beggar. Both of them are the same Broadway actor. If you go to the green room, you will see this guy changing his clothes and going out. The, the dialogue is different. The clothes are different. The actions are different. But it's both are the same. Because the emperor is not really an emperor. The beggar is not really a beggar. Both of them are the same actor. Similarly, in this case, ultimate reality beyond God, beyond the universe and beyond the individual is one Satchidananda, existence consciousness place. 
with the dress of Maya, that existence consciousness place, that Atman, that Brahman appears as God. With the dress of ignorance, that Satchidananda, existence consciousness place, appears as individual Jiva. In reality, neither Ishvara nor Jiva. It's, it's uh, existence consciousness place. All of this, there is a whole technical section called Lakshana, implied meaning. If you go to Vedanta Sara, you will see. Um, how do we analyze? There's a linguistic, etymological analysis, a lot of grammar also going into that. To analyze, you are that. First of all, that God has to be analyzed into, without Maya, what is it? Pure consciousness. You, without the body, without the mind, what, what are you? Pure consciousness. And therefore, you are the same. It's not less pure consciousness here and more pure consciousness there. It's just the same. The actor doesn't become a bigger actor by playing an emperor and doesn't become a smaller actor by playing a beggar. It's exactly the same person. So, this is what is meant here. I'm avoiding all the technicalities. Jnana Swarupo Bhagavan Atma. How do we realize that? Tvam prakrite paraha. You are beyond nature, beyond maya. He has given us a clue. How do I understand that I and God are one? He says, remove, go beyond prakriti, beyond nature, beyond maya. You will see you and God are one reality. Through maya, in that case, God is the vast, the omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. And you are the limited individual. And you are the worshipper, God is the worshipped. That relationship is correct. The great devotee Hanuman understood, expressed it best, best expressed it best. Um, when Ramachandra asked Hanuman, what do you think of me? How do you understand me? And Hanuman's reply was, Deha buddhya dasoham, jiva buddhya tvadankshaka, atma buddhya tvamevaham iti me nishchitamati. As this body, as this Hanuman, this being, I am the servant and you, Rama, you are the master. Lord is my master, I am the servant. But as this sentient being, who has gone through many bodies earlier, as this, as this individual sentient being, I am a part and you are the whole. I am a part of you. You are the divine, I am a part, a spark. Upanishad says like a bonfire out of which thousands of sparks emerge. So the Brahman or God is compared to a bonfire out of which all we are all emerging. So I am part of you. You are the cosmic whole, I am part of you. And then finally, Atma Buddhi as pure consciousness, as the self, as pure consciousness. You and I are the same. Which one is correct? Are you a servant? Are you a part of me? Or are you the same as me? All three are correct. Iti me nishchitamati. This is, this is my conviction. In reality, at the core, in essence, I and you are one. I am you, you are me. As um, this universe, as this conscious being, I am a part of you. You are the cosmic whole. It is an integral part of you. As body, come down to this world as we are here right now. You are the Lord who am, I worship in the temple, church and mosque. And I am your servant. I am your devotee. All are good. All are fine. I mean, that is, you know, Hanuman is regarded as Maha Jnani. But Hanuman Chalisa, Jnana Gun Sagar. As an ocean of knowledge and other virtues. This is true knowledge. Good. Let us. Uh, all right. Shraddhasva tata shraddhasva natra moham kurushva bho jnana swarupa bhagavan atma tvam prakriti para. Once you transcend prakriti maya, you realize bhagavan and you are the same reality. Um, all right. We will do a little QA, not a long one, so that we will. Um, let's. I'll call upon you. <laughs> come, come, come to this one. Just come here. Come to this this one only. One. I'll take, wait. Um, one, two. Come, 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 come. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. One, two. You also wanted to ask? No. One, two. You wanted to ask? Three. Let's have three. Then I'll ask for more. If I can handle that, we will do it for fifteen minutes to one fifteen, and I think then we can ha handle. Um, we can get a handle back on the time. We can get it back on schedule, everything. All right, please ask the question. Yes. 
What's your name? Name? No, your name? Your name? No, your name. Tell us, tell us your, if you're comfortable, tell us your name. Okay. This body, mind, intellect is named so and so. Yes. And my, somebody else also did that a little earlier. In Vedanta, this is known as, it's, don't do it. <laughs> I, I got an email once saying, thank you for your lectures. I, the limitless existence, consciousness, bliss, known in this particular incarnation as Mr. Mishra. I bow down to you. So in Vedanta, we have two levels of truth, Vyavahara and Par Paramarthika, the transactional level and the uh, ultimate level. So language has full, full play in the transactional level. Just speak normally. Yeah. So... At our transactional level, Sarva Priyananda, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, Sharada Devi, it works, no problem. You don't have to say pure consciousness, limitless awareness, and body, mind, intellect. You know. Anyway, that's just a pointer. It's a good, good pointer. Yeah. Go on. Starting all over again. <laughs> yes. So I have a question regarding the four Mahavakya. It is two of them. Are they not depicting? Duality in the words themselves, there are three words. Why is there not one word that is called Mahavakya, such as Om? Hmm. Yeah, so Om does not explicitly show you the identity of Jiva and Brahman. Om, if you have to analyze it and find out the identity there. Om. Um, the definition of a Mahavakya, which is which shows you the identity of the Jiva and Brahman. That you are Brahman, the, the sentence must explicitly state that. From Om you can derive it, but it doesn't explicitly state it. What does Om explicitly state? Om. It's a single syllable. Om. Yeah, that's why. I don't know if you wanted to ask this. There is a technical point. I don't know if you are raising that. That's the problem of... Uh, all right, three words. Three words. Yes, Om does express non-duality, but you have to derive it. It does not straight away say that. Uh, I mean, you have to find out what is the meaning of Om then. Whereas, Tattvamasi, you are that. Uh, but I am talking about something else related to what you were saying. This is the thing. One of the objections to non-duality, when you say you are that or I am Brahman. So, one of the objections is it does not talk about a non-dual reality. It does not talk about oneness. Because a word denotes a meaning. Right? Bottle, one thing. The bottle is on the table. The word table means this. The word bottle means this. The word on means the relationship. So each word means something else. Words have meanings. They refer to different things. So in, the, in a sentence is a collection of multiple words. Multiple words, multiple meanings. So the objection is, if you have a sentence like, that thou art, it cannot mean one thing. Three words mean three different things, or at least two different things. So it does not mean that you are Brahman. It can mean, in Sanskrit grammar you can do this. Do this. Tattvamasi means, tasyatvamasi, you belong to that. You are a part of that. That is qualified monism or vishishtadvaita. Or another meaning, tattvamasi can also be derived as tad adhinatvamasi. You are a servant of that. That is God and you are the servant. In Sanskrit grammar, you can play these games. And you can't dispute it. Uh, so, uh, that, that becomes dvaita vedanta, dualistic religion. God and the individual. So, not identity. Part and whole relationship or separation. Our argument is three words. You can't say it's oneness. That might be one objection. Uh, so, uh, the answer to that, that is a classical objection. The answer to that in Advaita Vedanta is not always. There are two kinds of sentences. Some sentences are called Vyadhikarana. Uh, multiple words referring to multiple things. Other kinds of sentences are called Samanadhikarana. 
multiple words referring to the same locus or pointing to the same reality. Example, you chant, you know, Vishnu Sahasranama, Vishwang Vishnu Vashatkara Bhuta Bhavya Bhavat Prabhu, thousand names of Vishnu, thousand words referring to Vishnu. So, you can have multiple words referring to the same reality. Now, our challenge is to prove Tat Tvam Asi, Tat and Tvam, that and thou, refer to the same reality. Here, it, look at this sentence. Jnana Swarupo Bhagavan Atma. Bhagavan, one word. Atma means self, you. Both are said to be one. How? Jnana Swarupa. Both are consciousness. In that sense. So, a lot of these subtleties involved. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. I had a question about Yes. Yes. So there is good punya here in this life and punya in the past lives also. Punya means good karma. Part of our past karma is fructifying here. And you cannot in, blame individually. There is also a group karma and a social karma all together. Um, so all of it is it is coming together is the suffering in the present life of maybe a mass of people. But that's not their only karma. There is a huge amount of karma, part of which is coming out now. So it's like we have a storehouse that is called Sanchita Karma, storehouse. Part of that is used. Those who do inventory management, what, what we, I remember, last in, first out, first in, first out, with LIFO, FIFO, all those things were there. So some of it, of the inventory of my past karma is now manifested in this life. That's called the karma of this life. Uh, and there's a lot of good karma in the past also, which will become manifest once my, um, once my bad karma is exhausted. Anyway, you notice uh, Ashtavakra is not interested. He says, whatever is happening, that's at the level of body-mind, you are the Atman, you're free, realize it, it's over for you. Uh, Mundaka Upanishad says that... Um, um, Vidyate Hridaya Granthi Chidyante Sarvasamshaya Shiyante Chasya Karmani Tasmindrishte Paravare This enlightened one, Vidyate Hridaya Granthi, the knots of the heart are cut asunder. It's not a cardiac operation, knots of the heart. What it means is ignorance, which ties us to this body mind. I think I am this, this knot is cut. Chidyante Sarva Samshaya, all doubts are solved, for example, the two kinds of problems, impossibility problem and contradictory behavior problem, are gone forever. It's indubitable that I am limitless consciousness, existence, bliss. And then, Kshiyante Chasya Karmani, all the karmas, the stored up karmas are burnt up. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, if there's a mountain of cotton and you throw a burning matchstick into it, will it burn slowly or will it go up in a mass of flame? All your karmas are burnt up. When you realize, he says, Brahman as the high and the low. As the transcendent Brahman, you are Satchidananda. And as all of this, once this is realized, you are free. This is the goal. Karma itself we are not interested in. It's an explanatory device. It's a good device. But don't bother about it. Notice something. All the yogas take you beyond karma. Bhakti takes you beyond karma. Karma yoga takes you beyond karma. What is karma yoga? Without asking for anything in return, I shall keep on doing good. Unconditional. Wherever unconditionality is in, involved, karma is conditionality, causality. Yeah. Thank you. Dandav Pranam Samji, This is a question regarding the free will that we talked about. Uh, freely acknowledging its God will. That's what we were talking about yesterday. And Bhagavan was talking about Srimad Bhagavad Gita to Arjun. All the secret knowledge was given. And at the end of the uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, at the end, even chapter 18, Bhagavan is saying, 
No, I mean, it's a very good question. And uh, the straight answer to your question is, at the transactional level, at the Vyavaharika level, we must admit there's free will. Sri Ramakrishna, he approved of a very nice example. The cow is tied, uh, this is an old Indian uh, example, is t- tied to the tree and it munches grass all around itself. And if it pulls on the rope and tries to get to the grass there, then the farmer can c- come and give it a little longer rope or can come and tie it there. It can give you a little more freedom. So if you use the little bit of freedom available to you, then God gives you more freedom. So that is a kind of way of understanding uh, free will. As far as we are concerned, law, common sense, economics, you know, consumer choice, L- law, it's free will. Otherwise, you will, the judge cannot punish you for doing something wrong. Religion, morality, good and bad, all of these assume free will. Otherwise, what's the point of, excess, of giving any kind of instruction? But notice the subtlety of what that professor's analysis was. I mentioned it yesterday. That actually we don't have free will. We feel we have free will. Then the best way of this feeling of free will is to acknowledge the dependence on God. That's a very beautiful resolution of the problem of free will. Ashtavakra would say, forget it. To whom is this question appearing? To you, this consciousness. Know what this consciousness is. You are free. Your whole problem of free will is gone for you. Last question. We'll take up the question, other questions later. After I found a way to um, accept myself as um, a manifestation of, of consciousness, um, or after or after accepting the existence of um, consciousness itself as this realization that it comes. I think the best way is to trace it in your own experience. Your name is Aditya, right? Then go through the process of, you know, you look at this flower (laughs) and then you become aware of the eyes. And then you become aware of the mind which is watching the eyes and the body. Then you become aware of the thoughts and feelings in the mind. Where is this Aditya identity? Suppose there's a time before you were given this name Aditya, right? So even you're not literally the name. You're not even literally this body because the body changed from babyhood to childhood to youth now, right? You, the one which is watching the mind, is experiencing the mind, what is that? Is that Aditya? Can you give it a name? Does it have likes and dislikes? Does it have a personality? You see, likes and dislikes, personality, memory, all of that is in the mind, is it not? Right? No? Is the answer for why we are here too complex for our relatively bounded and limited consciousness? Hmm. Why we are here, is it too complex for, for our limited? Conscious, like our, our, uh, this vessel of a body that we're in, this brain that we're given, yeah. is it too complex for this to comprehend? Well, too complex for the intellect maybe. But the answer lies in something that's beyond the intellect, which is you yourself, you the consciousness. So instead of wrestling with these questions, you see all these answers will fall into place if you do that, any one of these exercises, like the Drik Drishya Viveka, which we did yesterday. See, what we do is instead of listening to that part, we race to the question. 
my intellect is asking a question. You told me I'm in infinite consciousness. What is this infinite consciousness? Instead of doing that, actually experience yourself. I mean, you see this flower, right? No? It's, it's true. You are aware that you have got eyes, because of which you see the flower. And you are aware that beyond the eyes, there is a mind which is thinking, which is thinking, this is a flower, the Swami is showing me a flower, why is he doing that? And this is a mind which is thinking. And you are aware of the thoughts of the mind. What is that which is aware of the thoughts of the mind? Don't give me an answer. Try to trace it back. You will see it's not the mind, it's something beyond the mind, which is experiencing the mind. And what Advaita is trying to say is that you are not just this body. You are not even just the mind and the intellect, you know, the memories which you call the person Aditya. You are the consciousness to which this mind, memories, personality is appearing through this body. What is that consciousness? That's what Advaita is interested in. Just con um, contemplate that. Thank you very yeah. much, Father. Because when you ask, uh, what is the purpose? Why are we here? I can give you answers. I can give you lots of answers. It will not um, settle any matter at all. And you have more questions after that. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we've got a little bit of time. I want to wrap it up at 1.30. Well, we need to go ahead and wrap it up now. We were supposed to wrap up at 12.45. Okay, so we'll wrap it up now. And then... <laughs> Reassemble, reassemble at? Um, 2.45. 2.45. All right. And please remain in your seats. Okay. Let me do a Shanti chant and then we'll, coming back at 2.45. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu Feeble applause. <laughs> All right.